Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum dear participants. Uh, welcome to this special extension lecture that we actually are going to continue in continuation of our previous session. So we were discussing some common misconceptions about Islam and we had uh, discussed uh, some of the gender issues uh, last time. This, this, and those included uh, the issue of the testimony of women and the issue of slavery. So today we are going to discuss two more misconceptions and they relate to the political and the, the jihad sphere uh, which relate to Islamic directives. Uh, so as you can see on your screen, the first of these misconceptions in this uh, regard relates to the nature of the political setup envisaged by religion or by Islam. And the second one relates to the fact that, well, we find that Islam in the name of the sword, uh, <laughs> so to speak, has been was spread in the times of the Prophet allegedly. So was it that uh, the militancy that we find in Islam today, a uh, continuation of the same uh, same pattern that took place in the times of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So we look upon both these misconceptions. And uh, so uh, we start off with the first of these misconceptions. And this actually relates to the political setup, which is envisaged by religion. And this is an area which is extremely important to realize because today, after the annulment of the uh, caliphate in 1924 by Mustafa Kemal, uh, Muslim political scientists have tried to envisage the Islamic political setup vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Quran and, of course, the practice of the rightly guided caliphate. In this regard, the models that we have today are the ones which have become exemplars for these Muslim scientists. And I'd like to point out all these models before you. And then we will see what the Quran says about these uh, uh, these political setups that have been actively in force uh, all, all over the Muslim uh, Muslim countries. And we know that there are today 55 or so independent Muslim countries and all of them uh, vying for the fact that the system that they follow vis-a-vis -vis their own uh, political setup is the one which is envisaged by religion. So let us uh, start off uh, with this uh, notion that as far as the rightly guided caliphate is concerned, we know that very soon in the times of Amir Muawiyah, it turned into a, a monarchy and a dynasty. And ever since the times of the Umayyads and then the Abbasids, and then subsequently Fatimids, Idrisids, and the Ottomans, the political setup that we have found in, uh, in general enforcement in most areas of the Muslim empire is that of a monarchy which means an autoc autocracy, and in other words, the Muslim ruler has the right to veto. He is an absolute ruler. He is a monarch. He can uh, seek advice and counsel from his, uh, from his uh, counselors and other people around him in the parliament. But as far as taking a decision is concerned, it is said that he alone is the person or he alone is the, is the person, person in which the power of the government uh, rests in. So the foremost model which our religious scholars present regarding the Islamic political system is that of a monarchy, is that of a kinship in which there is a kingdom. And they say that this kingdom is to be ruled by a king or by a monarch. And, and as far as the uh, transfer of power is concerned, then he can transfer his power through uh, his own nomination and the best possible uh, model for that is to look someone from amongst his own kin. So we see right from the time of Amir Mavia until the annulment of Caliphate in 1924 that the model that was practiced in the Muslim Empire was that of the father ruling and then the reins of the power, of power were transferred to the son or to any nephew and so on and so forth. So this is one model uh, which is envisaged by, by our Muslim scholars. And since they say that the closest that you can come to a kingship or a monarchy is a presidential system. So they insist that as far as a Muslim political system is concerned, the closest exemplar that you can find today, if you don't have a monarchy, is that you should have a presidential system in which the president or the head of state has the right to veto and has the right to rule. And all his uh, members of the parliament can give their own opinion. But for the sake of, uh, uh, for simplicity, I would say, that he has the right to overrule. Of course, he can accept their opinion if he wants to, but technically, he has the right to veto them. He has the right to overrule them. So one of the most important uh, exemplars, as we can see today, is that of uh, a monarchy, a kingship, or 
something in which there is autocracy. And an autocratic rule means that primarily the head of the state has the final say in all affairs of the state. The sec and you can see that this model, even today in, in certain kingdoms, it does exist. For example, in Morocco, uh, in, the, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, there are still uh, monarchies uh, which go on. But we do have uh, monarchies which are amalgamated or they run in tandem with a modern political system. But primarily, if you ask religious scholars and they, you ask them that what exactly is the political system which is envisaged by Islam, they would say that it's a monarchy. And if a monarchy is not possible, then the closest that, that you can get to a monarchy is a presidential state of a system. The second exemplar of an Islamic political system is uh, what we call as theocracy. So theocracy means that only religious scholars have the right to rule. And this theocracy stems from this understanding that Islam is, a, is an ideological religion. It has certain ideologies that have to be implemented. So anyone who is not competent, anyone who is not well versed with these ideologies does not have the right to rule. And a corollary of this is that only those people can rule who are scholars of religion. And as far as the interpretation of religion is concerned, it is only these competent authorities who can interpret religion. And therefore, they must be given the right to rule. Today, if you look around, you'll find that there are two Muslim countries which are exemplars of uh, this form of government. So one of them is Afghanistan, in which we find the Taliban ruling, and they think that because only religious scholars have the right to rule, so they would not allow anyone who is not a scholar of religion to be the head of state. Similar is the situation that you'll find in uh, Iran. So in Iran also, you'll find theocracy in which there is, of course, uh, this implementation of law of interpretation, uh, interpreting religion, and only the scholars of Islam are given this prerogative. So in Iran and Afghanistan, these are two models in which you'll see that theocracy prevails. So to sum up, the, the second contention or the second contender for a Muslim political system is that of theocracy. So we talked about monarchy and now we are talking about theocracy. The third system is uh, what we can find today being practiced in Indonesia, in Malaysia to some extent, in various other Muslim countries, and that is close to what we call as democracy, in which the opinion of the people uh, is taken and they are illicit, and from them we find the, the echelons of power emanating. So to them, although this is something which they do not find any exemplar in, in religious directives, but they say that the will of the people is something that has to be implemented because basically people are selecting or electing the people above them or over them in order to rule them. So this is a third exemplar of us in Islamic political system. A fourth exemplar, although I'd not, I'd not call it to be an exact exemplar, but it does exist or it used to exist and it has its, uh, its uh, reverberations in many, uh, many Muslim countries. And that is what we call as secularism. And if you want to have a model of secularism, then uh, Turkey, which was a former secular state, especially in the times of Mustafa Kemal, is another example of this in which they think that the rules of the state or the business of the state has nothing to do with religion. Religion is a private matter between a person and, the, uh, and his God. And as far as uh, the business and the rules of state are concerned, they will have nothing to do with religion and people will be independent and free to choose whatever system they would like to have. So in effect, we have these four models of Islamic political governance uh, in work today. And Muslim scholars, if you ask them, I can say that they are divided in these, at least in these three camps. The fourth camp, which is secularism, is not supported by Muslim scholars, uh, or I would say most Muslim scholars, uh, but the, we do find its support in some modern Muslim scholars, and they think that the rules of the state should have nothing to do with religion. Religion is something which is between a man and his God. As far as the political system is concerned, it should be governed by the people themselves and whatever they think to be right or whatever they deem to be appropriate uh, is something that should be implemented. And contrary to that, we have three other systems. And one of them, as I said, is monarchy. The other one is a theocracy. And the third one is democracy. So the question is that in the presence of all this data, how exactly can we determine or find out what the Islamic uh, 
ruling is in this case. So if we look at the Quran, we find a very clear verse in the in Surah Shura, uh, which is the 42nd Surah of the Quran and verse number 38. Uh, if I just go, it's just a very short verse, a very terse, a very concise verse. It says, Amruhum Shura Bainahum, which means that their system of governance is based on their consultation. In other words, this verse speaks of the fact that it is basically the will of the people that has to be found out. It must be elicited. And once it is elicited, it should be implemented. So the the term that we can use for this is, is a shura or shura, as you can call it from the Quran. But in for all intent and purposes, it is something which is very, very close to what democracy is. In democracy also, we find out the will of the people. And that is precisely what we do in the form of shura as well. So as far as people are concerned, who are going to rule, uh, according to this the verse of the Quran, they have to be elected by, by people themselves. And it is the will of the people that must be implemented. And so therefore, if there is a consensus on some, some individual, then that individual would be the ruler. And if there is a difference in consensus and there is a difference in opinion, then the opinion of the majority shall prevail. The opinion of the majority shall prevail, which means that whichever governing system or which, whichever governing party to be precise or faction enjoys the confidence of the majority would have the right to rule and this is precisely what we also find in most democracies although there are sham democracies although they are half from democracies but in its spirit the system of shura is very close to what a democratic setup is now once we have reached this conclusion we can clearly see that as far as the rightly guided caliphate is concerned, the first four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar, Usman, and Ali, may peace be upon them, all of them were democratically elected and all of them enjoyed the confidence of the majority. So just to have a look at what happened in the times of the Prophet, we know that before the conquest of Mecca, the Ansar were in majority and the Prophet would often go by their decision. But once Mecca had been conquered in the eighth Hijri, uh, we know that the Muhajirun's rule extended and they were the ones who prevailed. And ultimately, they are the ones who enjoyed the confidence of the majority. So therefore, the Prophet actually said that after him, the rulers would come from the Quraysh, which does not mean that he was pointing out to any, any uh, favoritism on his part or he, or he was trying to give his own faction any priority or superiority. That's far from the truth. What actually he meant was that because of the fact that once Mecca had been conquered, the Quraysh enjoyed the majority, they enjoyed the conference of the majority, so the rulers should be selected among them as long as they enjoy the majority. So this is what happened in the times of Abu Bakr, Omar, uh, Usman and Ali. So all of them were basically rulers from the Quraysh and it was the Quraysh who enjoyed the majority in their times. And it was only after Ali who had uh, that this, th this this thing reversed, and we know that our monarchy, uh, uh, the democracy turned into this monarchy, and we have a lot of uh, uh, things that we that have gone on in the name of religion, and so therefore we have to understand that as far as religion is concerned, the model that it gives is that of uh, of, of of shura, and that, as I said, is something which is absolutely close and very, very much in proximity uh, with democracy. In other words, as far as the, uh, the system of governance of Islam is concerned, it is very close to the model of democracy because Islam says that you have to select your own rulers from amongst your own cells. And if there is a difference of opinion, the, uh, the rule of the majority would prevail. Now, there is one question that might arise in the minds of people, and that is because of a narrative uh, which says that women cannot be chosen as heads of an Islamic state. This narrative is found in Bukhari, and it is reported by Abu Bakr, and it says that a, a, that a nation who elected a woman to this position of superiority or authority would not prosper. First of all, we have to understand this narrative is absolutely against the Quran. The Quran says that anyone who enjoys the authority of the majority, whether the person is a man or a woman, regardless, he or she can become the head of state. Secondly, we can see that this narrative came into prominence in the times of the Battle of Jamal uh, or the Battle of the Camel, 
in which Aisha and uh, Ali, uh, may peace be upon them, were pitted against one another. And it was only then when Abu Bakr reported this narrative and he said that I remember the Prophet saying this. So this in itself is something uh, which questions the narrative because this is like after the pos Prophet passing away and at the time when Aisha Ritala Anha was leading, uh, was leading the Muslim forces or one side of the Muslim forces, uh, it was in, in these circumstances that a companion remembered this narrative. And then uh, other than that, we find the chain of narration of this narrative to be also compromised and we can find some details uh, on this uh, crit uh, criticism as well. But all in all, this narrative cannot be accepted in the light of the Quran and of course, because of the fact that these words were spoken in a very, very specific context. So uh, in order to sum up this misconception or this uh, clarification, I would say that as far as the system of governance, which is suggested by religion or in other words, which is actually envisaged by religion is that of democracy or in its own term, it is called Shura. It does not at all condone any political system which is based on autocracy, on monarchy, on theocracy or even secularism. It has its own system of governance. And as far as this question is concerned, because this is a very common question that people raise, that if, if Islam is an ideological religion, which it is, then how can people who are not ideologues, who are not scholars of religion rule uh, because of the fact that if they're not scholars of religion, how can they uh, actually adopt religion at the collective state? Now, the answer to this question is that as far as uh, the understanding of religion is concerned, this is something which is always in contention because members of the parliament, members of the shura will always look at various interpretations and these interpretations would be discussed. And of course, whichever interpretation in a particular matter it enjoys the confidence of the majority members of the parliament, it will prevail. So in other words, members of the parliament need not be scholars. They don't need to be scholars of religion because they're not going to interpret religion in any way. It is basically the interpretation of religion which has already been done by scholars, which is going to be brought before them. And they just need to give one of those interpretations uh, the, uh, their, own, their own vote and whichever would be in majority would be accepted. And of course, this does not mean that whatever be, would be accepted would be in exact consonance with the truth. It is just a way to resolve matters. So as far as truth and falsehood is concerned, they are explicitly based on the Quran and the Sunnah. But as far as, as such affairs are concerned, which I have just referred to, they relate to the fact that when they were, whenever there is a dispute, whenever there is a difference of opinion, the will of the majority would prevail. And this brings us uh, to an end to this, uh, this particular misconception. Now I'll, I will move on to the second misconception, uh, which is related to the expansionism or the jihad or the militancy, which, so to speak, is something which stares a religion in the eye the general consensus in this regard is that Islam encourages its, its citizens, of course, to first adopt and implement religion in a particular piece of land. And once this is done, then they have to expand and all Muslim states should uh, unite ultimately and to form you know, uh, United Islamic states. And then they must conquer the rest of the world because according to them, uh, people who are not Muslims, they don't have the right to rule. And it is only Muslims themselves or Muslims who must rule. And therefore, it is important that in this regard, the expansionism policy, which actually, according to them, was something which was invoked in the times of the rightly guided caliphate, is something that they also must adopt. And they would try, they should try to expand the, the borders and the frontiers of an Islamic empire and convert it into a global Islamic empire. And the rest of the world uh, or the rest of the non-Muslims, as they would say, should live in subservience to an Islamic rule and they should pay jizya tax to them. Uh, so I have stated before you the general, uh, the general view in this regard. So I'm now going to critique this view in the light of the Quran and try to express before you that as far as this whole exercise is concerned, it is a, it is a totally flawed idea and has been circulated, I would say, or uh, to so to speak, it has been understood uh, on, this, on a certain premise which is something which is exclusively meant for the messengers of God. So we know from the Quran that there is a specific law regarding messengers of God. And that is the Quran says that these messengers are going to prevail come what may. And for them, it is destined that, that they shall prevail on their own enemies. And if they're enemies, they in some form or the other 
deliberately and intentionally deny the truth, then the Almighty says that they will be punished. So if you look at history, and this history, of course, spans from Adam right to Muhammad, may peace be upon them. So these prophets of God, uh, with Adam began the, the whole institution of prophethood, and on Muhammad, it, this institution ended, may peace be upon them. So these, this prophetic era, as we can call, this as an era in which messengers of God were sent on the face of the earth. They were like instruments of God's justice on the face of the earth. They delivered the truth. They delivered God's message to people uh, who were before them. They addressed them. They answered their objections and clarified them. And as the Quran says, they did itmam al hujja Itmam al hujja is a Quranic term, which means the truth was delivered to them to such an extent that they had no reason to deny it. And if they stubbornly insisted to deny it, then they would be punished in this world. So if you look at history, you'll find that these punishments took place, or this punishment took place in two forms. Either people who intentionally denied were they were killed through natural disasters, uh, like earthquakes, cyclones, tempests. And if you can see the history of Noah's nation, the Ad, the Samud, the, the people of Shoaib, the people of Lot, all these messengers of God, they delivered the truth to their people. And once they deliberately denied, the Almighty took matters in his own hand and he signaled his messengers to leave their nation because now divine punishment and the divine scourge is going to visit them and destroy them. And the other form of this prevalence that took place was through the hands of the believers. And they were authorized that if people deliberately insist and they also find a land where they can migrate to and gain political authority, then they, from there they could launch an offensive and conquer these people or decimate them. In the first case, what happened or what, what generally would happen was that they would not be, uh, they would not have sufficient place to migrate to where they could have political authority in their hands. So in such in situations, the Almighty would just ask their messengers to vacate that land and he would have them destroyed, people who had intentionally denied. But wherever they could find political authority, and we can see that this took place in the times of our own prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, that he was given this uh, uh, this area of Medina in which uh, the first Muslim state was set up, and he was authorized to punish people who had deliberately denied the truth. But we know that his own nation, the Quraysh, most of them accepted faith, and uh, the, of course the the advocates of fallacy they were put to death because of being advocates of falsity, but generally the, the rest of them accepted faith. Otherwise, they were given this authority to destroy them. So this is a law which has been mentioned in the Quran that the messengers of, are, of God are to prevail. And this prevalence, as I said, if you look at history, uh, the nature of this prevalence or the nature of this domination, so to speak, was of two forms. So if the opposing nation or the warring nation belonged to a polytheistic uh, creed, then they were put to death. And if they were monotheists in any way, then they were given the choice to live on their own religion, but then live in subservience. And this is, viewers, precisely what happened in the times of Prophet Muhammad regarding the people of the book. So the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, uh, they were, they are, we know that they are primarily monotheists. They were allowed to live on their own religion. They could practice their own religion in spite of being incriminated with heinous forms of polytheism all of them still followed God as the singular deity. Yes, this uh, this following was flawed in, in several ways and the Quran did not accept them. So we know that the Jews of the Arabian Peninsula, they regarded Azra to be the son of God. And we know that the Christians of the Arabian Peninsula, they regarded Jesus to be the son of God. So all both these denominations, they actually were incriminated with this heinous form of polytheism. But because they subscribed to, uh, to monotheism and they had their own interpretation or their own flawed interpretation, for example, of the concept of Trinity in the case of Christianity. But the Quran, although it did not acknowledge this, it accepted them on face value and they were regarded to be monotheists. And for monotheism, the rule was that they would be held subservient to a Muslim empire. They would not be allowed to live independently or to rule independently. And they would be also required to pay the jizya tax. And remember this punishment, whether it took place for the polytheists or for the monotheists, the primary reason for this punishment was intentional denial of the truth. This is a law which is in vogue, which is in practice only in the era of the prophets of God. After the prophets of God have gone away and with the departure of the last prophet, uh, Muhammad may peace be upon him, 
we know that this law cannot be enforced. So what has happened is that today, when Muslims think that they would like to follow the model of the Prophet, because we know that after the Prophet had passed away, the Sahaba, the companions, they warred on Byzantium, they warred on the Persian Empire, they conquered the Byzantium and the Persian empires, and they were actually, uh, when they were doing this, they were basically punishing them for their deliberate denial. But an erroneous interpretation of this was made when they thought that basically this is a policy of expansionism. They are expanding their, their empires it's like conquering other world, other people in the name of Islam. However, the Quran vehemently negates it. It does not say that the empire was spread uh, in order to spread or extend the frontiers of an Islamic empire. It was basically a punishment that was given to them. So the Almighty says that this punishment, which messengers of God give, on his behalf is going to take place or did take place in the era of messengerhood and it's also going to take place in the hereafter. But as far as the post prophetic era is concerned in which we are living, there is not going to be any such thing. This practice has been misread from the Quran and today when Muslim scholars think that they have to expand their empires, they need, they, they need to follow or they think that this is something which has been stipulated by religion. So they need to understand that there is, there is no such stipulation. The, the militancy or the jihad of the companions of the Prophet was not done for expansionism. It was basically God's implementation of just justice on the face of the earth on those uh, people who had intentionally denied. Today, this does not mean that you cannot uh, pick up arms for jihad or for militancy or for qital. The Quran says that the only legitimate reason for qital today is against persecution, is against oppression. So if there is oppression and persecution in a Muslim country and if all diplomatic ties fail and there is no other way out, then yes, this can be this can be thought of. But as I said, this is a very, very particular scenario. It's a very, very specific context. As far as imposing jizya is concerned, as far as conquering the world is concerned, for the sake of expansionism, this is something which is totally misunderstood. It's a flawed understanding. And as far as the Quran is concerned, it says that you have to live in peace with your neighbors. You just cannot go on and attack your neighbors. And you just cannot think that only religion or Islam has a right to rule. Everyone has a right to live on the face of God's earth. As far as they are concerned, yes, God will take their account. But this is no business of the Muslims to go on and rampage uh, other non-Muslim territories and bring them under their own rule. So I would now end my talk here with the description of this uh, whole uh, practice of God. Uh, the Quran says that this is basically uh, uh, an established rule of, it's an established principle of the Almighty. It says, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولُ فَإِذَا جَاءَ رَسُولُهُمْ كُوزِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْقِسْ That there, for each nation there is a messenger. And once a messenger comes, the fate of the, that nation is decided. So remember, this is the fate of a nation being decided on the face of the earth and it relates to its immediate addressees, the ones who are in right in front of them. It does not relate to people who are not in front of them. For them, their, their reckoning has been deferred to the day of judgment. So today, this would be an absolutely wrong and an erroneous perception that today also Muslims can go about conquering various non-Muslim countries, declaring them infidels, or declaring them as disbelievers and imposing jizya on them. That is something which was specific to the era of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So viewers, if you have any questions regarding these uh, misconceptions which I have just discussed, just to sum up, the first misconception that was discussed was reg regarding the Islamic political system and the second one was regarding the jihad or the qital that is today understood. And both of them in general are uh, concepts that have been erroneously understood. And as far as the Quran is concerned, it says that the only system of governance is something in which the will of the people has to be implemented. And as far as jihad or qital is concerned, there is no question of any expansionism in this regard. As far as the Quran is concerned, the only form of jihad today is that of uh, jihad which has been conducted against persecution or oppression. So now if you have any questions, please raise them. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Our first question comes from Shaban Ansari. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam. Dr. Sab, as you said that expansion is not done, it means that it is done until the profits are done. But for the persecution, it can be done. Just let me interject here. 
even in the yeah. times of prophets of God, it is not expansionism. So you see, this word is it should be done away with. It is basically punishment uh, for denying the truth. So basically, what the prophets of God did, and for example, the Sahaba did in their own times when they conquered uh, Persia and when they conquered the Roman empires, it was not that they were expanding the boundaries of the Muslim empire. It was because yeah. they were. They had denied the truth, and as a result of that, they were being punished. So basically, it's a punishment that was meted out to them. No, I'm saying that, like, as of today's case, which we, which people understand, that the jihad is being done, and the name of Islam is being used, and the name of Islam is being used, and the name of Islam is being used. की हुकूमत कायम की जाए तो ये चीज बिल्कुल नहीं है एक्सपेंशनिज्म नहीं है लेकिन जो प्रोसिक्यूशन है उसके खिलाफ अब जैसे आजकल फलस्तीन में जो हालात हैं मसला ये कि पहल उन्होंने की है हमला करने में तो अब ये जो मुस्लिम ममालिक हैं ये सारे मिलके उनके साथ उन वो जिहाद कर सकते हैं क्या उनको रोकने के लिए या क्या मुमकिन है we don't see any persecution we actually see two factions at war with each other we see that they are at war since the last 40 years and the hamas attacks them and then we have a counter attack from the israel uh, people of israel and this is a war which is going on in between them and this does not elicit for any militancy on the part of the muslim states what they should do is that they should try to to suggest to these people that they should take uh, take on a peaceful uh, peaceful performance in this case and the whole exercise should be in line with what the united nations had suggested way back in 1948 when israel got it in its inception and if you look at history you'll find out that it in 1948 when the state of israel was born the united nations had suggested that because this area is something which is held dear by all these three abrahamic religions the jews the christians and the muslims so we will divide uh, the land of palestine into three independent three independent territories so one of them would belong to the palestinians the other one would belong to the israelites and there would be an international city of jerusalem which would be governed by the international rule or by, by international community or by international stipulations and people of all these three religions would be allowed to go in this in this city so this is how things have progressed but today what has happened is of course is something in which one part of the palestinians the plo which was formerly also a militant organization it has turned into a more peaceful one but we find the hamas still uh, being a militant organization so militancy is not supported by islam in any way so you need to first understand or we need to understand it has to be a peaceful transfer of power or a formula in which they can agree upon but any militancy in this regard and we remember we also know that when hamas actually took the lead they had actually bombed innocent civilians uh, in in the territory of israel so this was absolutely uncalled for uh, so in in reply what israel has done is even more worse and heinous so that goes without saying but the thing is that this uh, this is like a revenge which is taking place one side bombs the other side and then in revenge the other side bombs it back and this is like a unending process and this in no way can be condoned and in this matter we have to go back once again to the basic principles acha isme matlab ye samajh aaya na ke wo persecution wo hai jo war nahi hai yani war ke baghair jo persecution means that you are not being you are not being uh, allowed to establish your religion to practice your religion this is what persecution is that you are not being allowed to practice your own religion this is called fitna or persecution by the quran okay thank you जाफिस and form a a real islamic country what was their basis oh, for trying to do this for them it was never a case of uh, persecution you see they thought that it was basically they who had the right to rule and uh, the rest of the people don't have the right to rule they think that islam could only be implemented by people who are advocates of religion or people who uphold religion so basically what they were doing was they were they were trying to implement religion through a militant way it is much the same what the taliban did 
in Afghanistan uh, some some years ago, and they are still there. It's not the will of the people that they are following. It's basically their own implementation and their own understanding. So ISS is no different. So whether it's the Al Qaeda, whether it's ISS, or, or whether it's Abu Bakr Baghdadi, all of them have the same philosophy. So if you remember, in some of my lectures earlier on, I had pointed out that Osama bin Laden actually in 1990s, when he was not that famous, he had declared war on the United States. This was the, in early 1990s, and he said that he's going to destroy the United States. And the verses which he cited were exactly the ones which Prophet Muhammad and the other prophets of God cited in favor of the practice which is specifically meant for the prophets of God. So as I said, all these factions, they, they try to interpret the, 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 the example of the prophets of God without realizing that this is their sole prerogative. Only messengers of God have the right or the divine right on God's behalf to punish people because you see what they are doing is they're implementing God's will. So they are God's representatives on earth. They are presenting religion in its ultimate form. And God says that if, you, if they deny you, it's like they deny me and therefore you can conquer them. But this is not the case with ordinary Muslim preachers. They don't have a right to do this. So that is precisely why that, that Osama bin Laden, Abu Bakr Baghdadi, ISS, Al-Qaeda, Taliban and all their likes, they, they have tried to copy the model of the messengers of God without thinking that this model could not be copied because these messengers have the divine right to do so, whereas others have not been given this right. But they're saying that the, the regime in Syria and Iraq were persecuting their people and they were, they were see, it was them, their duty to rescue them, them. Yes, I do understand that. For them, the, the model was to change the government, to bring a peaceful change of power. Or if that was not possible, then this is what they needed to do, that they should that they have presented their message to the masses and would have tried their best and maybe even laid down their lives for that or sacrificed their lives. But to take up arms and start killing people, this is something which the Quran does not authorize. It says that this cannot be done in, in, at any cost unless you have an independent piece of land in which you are able to establish your own rule. And then, uh, of course, on, on the vis various basis of jihad that we have discussed already, they are given this prerogative to attack people. Otherwise, this is not something that they were initially or in any possibility have been authorized to do. Moving on, Baran Nashur, you're up next. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my question is related to the session we had last week about uh, slavery and uh, sexual relations with the slave women. Uh, I, I found I, I re actually recite the wrong verse. The verse was actually Ayah 24 from Surah Nisa, and uh, I mm -hmm. took the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, and mm -hmm. uh, I will read it out loud, so maybe you can help me with clarifying. Also mm -hmm. forbidden are women already married, except those whom your right hand possesses. The mm -hmm. ayah means you are prohibited from marrying women who are already married, except those yes. whom you acquire through war, for you right. are allowed such women after making sure they are not pregnant. pregnant. Mm -hmm. Imam mm -hmm. Ahmed recorded that Abu Said al-Khudri said, we captured some women from the area of Autas who were already married, and we disliked having sexual relations with them because they already had husbands. So we asked the Prophet about this matter, and this ayah was revealed. Consequently, so, we had sexual relations with these women. This is the wording collected by At-Tirmidhi and Nasai, Ibn Jarir, and Muslim and his Sahih. So, actually, as I said, that this is again a flawed interpretation of the events that took place in the times of those battles. I have already discussed this earlier on, that the Quran has vehemently said that once you have waged war. And we know that in Surah Muhammad, the verse says, Imma mannam ma fida, And this verse was revealed right at the time of the Battle of Badr, which was the first war which the Muslims fought against the Quraysh. And in this war, they were explicitly said that they could not enslave any prisoners of war. They should set them free. So the words are Imma mannam, which means that you set them free as a favor. And the second part of the clause is Imma fida, which means that you have to set them free for ransom. So with or without ransom, you have to set them free. So as far as all reports are concerned, which go against this Quranic verse, they cannot be accepted. And either they have been misreported by, by the narrators or there is some more detail which is missing. As far as the Quran is concerned, it was absolutely clear in this regard that, as I said earlier on, that the only way in which uh, in those times, uh, which was a big source of slavery, were these wars in which uh, men and women would be caught and enslaved. 
So the first thing which the Quran did was that it put an end to that. And that's the end of that. So you see, once the Quran says something, a narrative which is, it, it gives you a different view, it cannot be accepted. And I'm pretty sure that in this particular case, uh, which in which you are discussing uh, uh, a tirimizi, of course, that is something which is which is dependent on a report that he has acquired from some from his sources. And I'm pretty sure that those sources have missed out a lot of details. The Quran has never allowed such things to happen. And if it did happen, I, I would dare say it, it, it did happen uh, in only in that case when they were the, the people who were caught were already slaves. It's not that new slaves were inducted. People who were caught in that war were already slaves. And until and unless their own owners did not come to them to rescue them for ransom, they were used as slaves. So you see, their status was not changed or any free man was not caught and made a slave. Their own slave status was kept as soon as their owners came and either gave them ransom so that they could set them free or took them back. So they continued on in their own state. So I do think that this is what has actually happened. And this has been somehow distorted. And the narrative that you have cited from Tiramizi brings out uh, in a very, very crooked form what actually might have happened. All right. But uh, I had to... The, what, what would be the correct the interpretation of it? is basically, well, Mosanatu bin Nisai illa ma malakat aimanukum, if I'm citing that correctly. So it says that as far as your uh, as your sexual relations are concerned, they, you, uh, women who are already married, they are prohibited to you. So you just cannot have, uh, I mean, you just cannot marry women who are already married. So except women whom you, you are able to capture in a war, who, uh, who are there for you as slaves. Uh, in that case, you, have, you can marry them with the permission of their owner. So the words are, You can marry them. It's not, it doesn't say you can enslave them. It says, You must marry them with the permission of their masters. So remember, it's basically a marriage that's going to take place. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. We're running short on time, so I'd request all the participants to keep themselves to one question and try to keep it to today's topic. And if we have extra time, we can take um, questions from other topics too. Uh, Shabnam, please go ahead. Thank you, Maria. Sir, a very short question. It's related history. Sir, in your opinion, this continent, which Muhammad Ghauri and Sultan Mahmood Ghaznavi have attacked, is this expansion in this category? So you see the onslaughts of Mahmoud Ghaznavi or the likes of Ghari and all these conquerors, they, they, I mean, they did not do these uh, after asking what religion told them. Basically, they were expansionism. They, basically, they were wars which were fought uh, in which they were trying to expand their own empire. Uh, they had nothing to do with any of their own uh, understanding of religion. It was like uh, going to a different territory to expand their own empires or to find new areas in which they could rule. So when Shahabuddin Ghori or when Aladdin Khilji or we find the slave dynasty ruling the, the subcontinent, as far as they are concerned, I mean, they did so in accordance with the norms of normal practice of expansionism. It never took place uh, as far as uh, anything to do with the religion is concerned. I mean, they were not doing this in, in consonance with any, with, any, with any directive of religion. I mean, they were doing it out of a normal, normal procedure that was in vogue in those times. Right. Sir, that is something that you shouldn't have done. So you see, destroying uh, idols is something which the, the Quran prohibits. I mean, we present this, uh, this story in, in, a, in a very uh, elevated manner. We feel pride in it. But the Quran says that you have to respect all other religions. Yes, uh, right. in the land of Arabia, you cannot build a temple. You cannot, uh, because it's basically a land of, uh, of monotheism. But in all other countries, you must respect all other religions. So whether they are Hindu temples, whether they are Sikh temples, whether they are Christian churches, whether they are Jewish synagogues, they must be given total protection. So if uh, Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi destroyed Somnath for 17 times and we presented the story in a very elevated way, this is uh, something which is actually shameful. He shouldn't have done this. Right. Right. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sleem. I had a question of my own. So... For the prosecution, can you do it if it's coming from a place where the authorities seem to be Islamophobic? Something like the case in Myanmar, where it seems that the authorities themselves just hated Muslims, and so they right. kept trying to drive them out. 
So you see that that is something which is an expression that we have to understand that persecution means that you are not allowing a minority to live according to the religion that it would, would like to live. Wherever that is, regardless whether it's Myanmar or any other community without going into political details, uh, what I was trying to point out is the Quranic concept that if this is something which, is go which goes on, then this gives you the right to lift arms against that country. It only gives you the right. It does not become a, an obligation. It does, does not become a, um, something which is mandatory. You see, you have in today's world, when you all countries are members of, of the United Nations Charter, remember, in the United Nations Charter, you cannot attack any country. So you are in a peace agreement with all countries, unless you denotify yourselves as a, as a member country of the United Nations. So you see, you are already committed that you will not launch any aggression. So first of all, you have to understand that uh, there is an international community. If there is some persecution going on anywhere, then moral pressure from that community needs to be exerted, maybe through the UN, maybe through other Muslim countries. But if that fails, then yes, that authorizes the uh, Muslims to, to lift arms against them. But as I said, then there are other conditions that have to be fulfilled. For example, uh, diplomatic ties should fail. For example, the attack should be launched by a state, not by militant groups that is being done normally these days. And for example, it has to be done when you know that you're going to be able to actually wipe out these people and it's not going to be a suicidal mission in which you are just going to start the war and then end by your own death. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sleem. Nagir Twani, please go ahead. Uh, okay, Dr. Isabel. Dr. I have got recently chance to visit Turkey and Top Copy Museum. And I have seen over there, there is one verse, uh, there is one calligraphy and along with that calligraphy, it's written that the Muhammad, I will read it for you. Uh, they are saying, the calligraphy along with that calligraphy, Prophet Muhammad is the Lord of the world, heaven, man, and jinns. So, I don't understand is that, this. Is that an Arabic verse, or is that a translation that you're reading out? That's uh, the calligraphy, which is uh, is being... Uh, uh, what? I mean, I mean, there's there's not something which is mentioned anywhere in the Quran. It's just like a, I would say, a sentence of glorification. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that's it's anything to do with with religion. It's maybe something which is just, uh, which is just displayed there. I mean, someone has just written this this sentence out in some calligraphy. Maybe it's the Kufic one or the Hijazi script or any other script. So I, I, it has nothing to do with religion in any way. No, it's not written, but see, even then, what do you think about that statement? Could you read it out again, please? Prophet, Prophet Muhammad is the Lord of the world, heaven, man, and jinns. Oh, this is absolutely incorrect. Lord of the world and heaven is just God himself. I mean, there's no human got, being. Sir, oh, yeah. Okay. There's Hang no on. human being who can have the status. Uh. So that's why I took the screenshot. I will send it to you. You can have it. Okay. Uh, look at. Um, okay. And the second do. thing is, uh, yeah. And the second thing is, uh, while reading the uh, Bajamat, the uh, the Imam was saying Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. I don't understand what he's saying. Yeah, this Allah is Allah how is the Turks speak. I mean, the Turks speak Arabic in a different dialect. Allah Akbar. Mm -hmm. What you see, Allah Akbar, basically is Allah Akbar. But this is how they speak. So it's not mm -hmm. that they're. They are speaking some other language. It's just the way that they speak the Arabic language. Thank you very okay. much, Dr. Sleem. We have a question in the chat that asks, why is it popularly believed that Islam was spread on the pest of the sword? I think I just answered that question in the later part of my talk, in which I said that there are certain practices of the certain verses of the Quran which have been misinterpreted. These verses relate to the punishment that was given to people who had intentionally denied the truth. And since the Roman and the Persian empires, to them, truth had been conveyed through those letters which the Prophet wrote to those people. And they are 12 in all. If you look at history in the 5th or 6th Hijrah of his, of his ministry, the Prophet sent, sent letters to these countries. And they belonged to the Roman and the Persian empires. And they were told that uh, a Prophet has arrived. And he has arrived in accordance with the predictions which are found in their scriptures. So the Romans were, I mean, the, the Christians and the Jews, they were waiting for a final messenger of God. And as far as the Persians are concerned, although they don't ha they didn't have any book of this regard, but they knew or they were told that once a prophet of God or a messenger of God arrives on this earth, then he becomes a, vic he becomes a symbol of God's justice on this earth. 
And once that happens, then people have to submit to him because submitting to him is actually submitting to the authority of God. This is something which is specific to the era of God's prophets. That's what I have explained earlier on. It cannot be extended beyond that. So if, if the Sahaba of the companions, if they conquered the Persian empires and the Roman empires, it was not because of expanding their territory. It was because they were punishing people for denying the message of truth. And this is only something that can be done by God's messengers. Today, we are not messengers of God. The institution of messengerhood has terminated. So if we start doing that, that in effect would mean that we are playing the role of God. Only God has that prerogative. And that prerogative ended with the era of the messengers. And it will restart in the hereafter. But in this intermittent, intermediary period, which is called the post prophetic period, we, this practice is no longer in vogue. And it is by not understanding this fact that factions like the Al-Qaeda, like the ISS and like the Taliban and all the rest, they think that they need to follow the, the, the exemplars of the prophets of God without realizing that this was a practice that was specific to the prophets of God. Thank you, Dr. Salim. The next question asks, UN has failed in stopping wars, and especially, especially on Muslim countries. They've already broken their contract. Do Muslim countries still have to obey UN charter? So if they have to disobey those, that charter, then they must openly announce that they're going to break that charter. You see, it's not imperative for them to follow that charter. But if they wish to denounce it, then they should do it openly. This should not be the case that they have signed an agreement and they go back on, uh, on that agreement. First, they must revoke that agreement. Yes, then that would give them the authority to do whatever they'd like. But they must first come out of that agreement. Dr. Slim, you mentioned Abu Bakr. Is that somebody who's different than Abu Bakr? Absolutely. Abu Bakr was the caliph of the Prophet. And Abu Bakr is, is someone who is totally different. He was an infant in the, in the times of the Prophet. I mean, he was not an infant, actually. He was a very young, young boy. So it was only in the times of the Battle of Jamal or the Battle of Camel that he remembered this, this whole hadith. Yeah, and he, Basically, in order to discourage Aisha from her from her uh, endeavor, that he he said that I remember this narrative of the Prophet. So he's a, an entirely different person. Thank you, Dr. Salim. <laughs> yes, um, Dr. Salim, uh, commenting on last week's lecture, I just wanted to bring to your attention what do you think of a lot of uh, Muslim men. In, in America who are married, but in order to be able to settle in America or green, get green cards, uh, they go and offer money uh, to an American, thousands of dollars, without telling them that they are married people mm. and, uh, and get married just to be able to reside mm. in the United States. And, <laughs> and once the green... Clearly, you know that this is a fraud and a deception that they're doing so. It's just to obtain a green card that they are getting married, which is absolutely, uh, I mean, I would say it's worthless and shameless and shame, shameful, I would say, because it's not for the purpose of marriage that they are marrying. It, they have some other purpose. And, and when that purpose is, is achieved, they often end up in divorcing that wife. Yeah, thank you. Yes, they do that. What happens to their first wife? I mean, so I, that's what I'm saying. I mean, this is something which is a total fraud that they do. And I mean, this, this has absolutely no justification. But now the American government, when these things are happening, they start checking on you. They come to your house, then even ask they you, do. what is the and color of your that, husband's that is right toothbrush? Do. Yes, that they because do. I think they have a right to do that. Because you see, in the United States, you have a law in which you cannot marry more than one wife. And so what Muslim preachers or even Muslims do in the United States is that they they don't declare a second wife. They contract a marriage with her on the basis of Sharia. They have a personal agreement with that lady uh, that you're my wife. And they don't declare that second wife before the authorities, which is, of course, a fraud that they're doing. And they are not allowed to do that. If they live in a country in which there's a law, then you have to respect the law in, which, in the country that you're residing in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salim. Last question of the day, Nagar. Please go ahead. Or Abid. Yes, Dr. Salim, uh, I have seen uh, in the Globe Coffee Museum, there is one uh, verse written, they are saying it is written by the Prophet Ali, uh, oh, yes. sorry, the Caliph Ali, Caliph Ali, so yes. a 6th, a 7th, 8th century, that, is it that possible that... Uh, that it's not possible, I mean, uh, I have seen all those details, if you look up uh, the orthography, the script of that, uh, that verse as well, you will find out that these are copies of 
uh, which were done many centuries later. None of them uh, satisfy the, the precepts of authenticity and it's not properly dated back. Not only that, if you find uh, the copies of the Quran which are placed in the top copy museum in Turkey, none of them are the original because you see what they boast about is that these are the Osmanic copies. But uh, a careful analysis of the script, which is the orthography of that uh, of those codices, if you look at them, you'll find that they are Kufic. And the Kufic script that they, uh, that they were written in, they are copies of the copies of copies. So they were maybe 300 or 400 years much, I mean, after the Prophet. They are not the Usmanic copies at all. The only closest exemplar as a copy that we have today is that codex in Birmingham that was discovered in 2016 by Alba Fazli, that Italian uh, woman who was doing a PhD on, the, uh, on, on her own subject, and she stumbled upon this manuscript. And about that, that manuscript we know, which has uh, two or three folios and parts of Surah Kahaf, Surah Maryam, and Surah Taha, uh, those are very close to the Quran that we have today. And the surface on which they were written, the animal parchment, was an animal uh, which was alive probably in the time of the Prophet. So it's like about 20 to 30 years after the Prophet. That is the that is the earliest Quranic evidence that we have in written form to date. All others to date uh, that we know of or which ex uh, which actually claim to do so, they are not true in their claim. What's the script of the uh, uh, the so the, one? Script, this, the script of the, the 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 original script in which the Qurans were written was is called the Hijazi script. It is the Hijazi script in which the Quran was written. The Kufic script actually post-stated. Okay, thank you. Dr. Reese, please go ahead. Sir, you just told that God punishes people, uh, disobedient people by death. By giving them death, punishment of death. No, I didn't say that. I said that in the times of God's messengers, this is specific. Yeah. It's not in all yeah. times. Yeah. In the times yes, of yes, God's talking, yeah. I am talking about the same time. Right. So, so my question is that uh, death is a uh, everyday affair for God. How it is a punishment for people? God kills people every day. He can kill bad people. He can kill good people. Yeah. But how it is punishment yeah. for bad people? So these this is, these are two different practices of God. One is normal death, which takes place. I mean, every person dies. That's one thing. And one is a whole nation which is punished. So the nation of Ad, the nation of Samud, the nation of Lot, the nation of Noah. These were nations who, who were polytheistic in nature. They, they worshipped more than one god. To them, messengers were sent. And these messengers conveyed the truth to them. And after that, when they denied, the Almighty said that I am now going to collectively destroy you. It's not just about a couple of human beings. It was a whole nation that was destroyed as a result of tempestuous forms or cyclones or earthquakes, all these natural disasters. So that is an entirely different law. And that law has been mentioned at various instances in the Quran. It's not normal death. Normal death relates to a single person. It's like a collective death of a nation. So suppose uh, there are earthquakes or and other natural calamities. Uh, so so as I said, can... natural calamities when they take place today, they are like a forms of trial. But in the in the era of the nations of the prophets of God, God has mentioned this this uh, in its in its old historical perspective that when ancient nations were destroyed uh, because of earthquakes or cyclones, it was not like a natural death. It was a punishment for their intentional denial. So the Quran says, Kafaru arafu, that they denied after deliberately knowing what the truth was. And the Quran said that we are going to destroy them. In Surah Mujadla, we have the verse which says, that it is ordained that my me and my messengers are going to prevail. So there's a whole law which is mentioned uh, in at a number of instances, and I would I, I would like to suggest to you that if you could read out a, a small book that I wrote, it's called Playing God, Misreading a Divine Practice. It lays out this law in detail, and basically it, it describes us that when this collective death took place of various nations, it was not a natural sort of a death. It was death because of a certain punishment. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Slim. Then we'll take Visma too. Visma, please go ahead. Dr. Salim, um, uh, my question was that why is it that whenever Muslims either wage war or if they're, um, if they're attacked, Islam becomes a very uh, important, integral part of um, how or why um, that Muslim country is at war? Um, when did this propaganda begin? Because when Hindu, when India attacks Kashmir or sorry, not attacks, but when they 
they have their um, you know um, they treat them the way kashmiris are treated or when uh, russia or ukraine have a war or any other country of any other religion when they are fighting religion is not a very important integral part of that war but islam is always at war mm-hmm. or any um, muslim nation is always termed that way when did that propaganda begin that muslims only or muslim countries you know their most important uh, reason for fighting is islam why is that i mean this this happened after 1924 when the caliphate was annulled so in the times of uh, the i mean the when the dynasties and the monarchies were there in the umayyads and the abbasids and the fatimids and the idrisids and the ottomans and the moguls all these empires as long as they were there it i mean this narrative never never originated because muslims were already in power however in 1924 when the caliphate was annulled by mustafa kamal it was in the last 100 years that now whenever we find uh, muslims or non muslims at 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 daggers drawn it is basically because muslims think that they have lost their past glory they they once ruled a better part of the uh, of the globe and now they must regain their past glory and the only way to do that is to first implement religion in their own country and then expand that country to become a united muslim uh, sort of an empire and then bring the rest of the world in subjugation so you see this is like a post 1924 scenario in the last 100 years which has developed it was never there in the times of the of the dynasties because at that time muslims were already in power in one in one part of the globe or the other so this is basically a fresh narrative of the last 100 years and i have just described that how flaw flawed it is because as far as the quran is concerned it does not speak of any expansionism it is an erroneous interpretation of the uh, of the acts which were perpetrated i would say or carried out by the by the caliph by the caliphs abu bakr umar usman when they conquered the roman and the persian empires people thought that they are expanding the muslim empire i just tried to uh, dispel this misconception that he, they were not expanding they were primarily doing the job of the prophet of god according to which people who intentionally deny the truth they were they are punished on the face of this earth so they were just punishing people for this intentional denial and this became an erroneous basis of interpretation that perhaps they were expanding and subjugating people in the name of islam yeah but, but muslims also seem to take pride in it you know they, they that's so, another aspect that the propaganda precisely precisely that's what i'm trying to say trying to say here that this this is something which they because of the fact that they had a very glorious empire in the past so they 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 take pride that well we are going to regain that empire and the only way to do so is by force okay thank you thank you so much dr salim for staying extra and giving us a very informative session and thanks to all the participants for joining us today inshallah we'll meet again next week for a new set of uh, sessions until then assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaykum as-salam. Thank you.